Hi there, I am Tammy Lee Meyer, and I'm joined today by Peter Anderson. Hello. Uh, so this is our first segment in what, what is a three-part series of peer-to-peer -peer podcasts. And uh, day before yesterday, when I, when I uh, put out one of these with John Husband, someone replied that it was kind of like a Venn diagram. Oh, yeah. Uh, so in this one, we're really going to look, Peter, at your work and what you've been working on for, I think you said it's either seven or, or ten years of, of work uh, that culminated. 15. How many? Fifteen now. 2003 I started really doing this, yeah. Great. So it's, it, and which culminated in a proposal for the Global Challenges Foundation. Yeah, it's, pretty much, it's pretty much all in there. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for us to really kick the wheels on what it is our proposal for the Global Challenges Foundation is, uh, and it's the Global Challenges Collaboration. So I'm really honored that you want to present your work and your ideas and give us an opportunity to see where our work intersects and yeah. to really foster the collaboration we need to meet the global challenges that we face. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, fantastic to discover you all. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'll just I, I think maybe perhaps in a sense, uh, I'm kind of relieved I didn't discover you <laughs> before, the, before the deadline because collaborating on such a massive project, you know, a proposal, um, sounds like a heck of a challenge. Sounds like you guys had a challenging time pulling together the ideas from so many different people, whereas I was just working with one other person and we were already very much aligned and I was very much leading it. Um, and so, you know, there was really no friction. We didn't really have to iron anything out. It was, you know, it was just really a case of me knuckling down and trying to put a narrative on everything I'd learned over the last 15 years, which is just such a fantastic process, thought process to go through. And I don't care at all what the outcome is. Um, it's Because it, it's always been like, always known that, I'm trying to do something big. I'm trying to work on something big. I'm trying to provide a solution, um, a significant systemic solution. But trying to define that and get that across to other people. I mean, I didn't even know myself, really. Uh, I just knew I had all these bits. I had all these bits of the puzzle. And um, it was only really to, you know, write this, what is this, about 7,000 words. And just putting it all into nice chapter headings, you know, <laughs> And, and making it all flow and think, oh, actually, this goes here and that goes there. And, and then being challenged by, the, you know, the global challenge definition was just so perfect for it. And it was great that someone acknowledged that this, it hasn't been figured out. You know, there's no one out there yet this, that's really going to take responsibility for this. And, and what it made me think was that, because they're hooked up with the Earth League, you know, with all these professionals and all these millionaires, you know, it was a billionaire that launched it. And then they got all these millionaires like Brand and Branson and Tutu and all these different people. These people have got shed loads of money. And it just makes me laugh, really, because with all their money and all their consultants <laughs> that they can afford, they can't figure out the answer to their problem. And, and so what they're doing is creating this project and I guess they are assuming that there's someone or some people in some bedrooms or some garages somewhere that <laughs> have got an idea that might you know that might be really important um, and, and we do <laughs> we do <laughs> they're right <laughs> um, so yeah I feel like that you know my, my nickname on Skype is Captain Caveman because that, that's I spent most of the time in the dark for the last 15 years you know, and occasionally I come out and go to a conference and sort of display my work and get the feedback. And then it's like right back into the cave with the feedback <laughs> for another six months and more development, more trialing, more testing. And that's kind of how it's been, really. Um, so and it still is. <laughs> so first off, thank you 
thank you for spending that 15 years in the cave and really because it, <laughs> it takes a lot of work to uh, understand what's happening as well as look out in the world and see the different pieces that can maybe help mm -hmm. and there's a lot of contemplation and and a lot of work on a lot of levels to be able to articulate um, uh, the pieces as you have and how fantastic that you have done that work um, yeah and I think the, the big challenge is is actually simplifying it you know that because I, I mean you know it's easy it, to read these sorts of big documents and big proposals and just get completely bamboozled um, and I think one of the challenges that I've managed to I've been fairly successful at is simplifying it into language and concepts that people can really grasp and then you know they can just run with it you know if you're in a if, if people are in a position personally to actually do something then that's something that they can either pick up or they can run with so so that that's the challenge as I see it is not really getting complex it's getting simple yes it's like we, this has got to be so simple that everybody can grasp it and, and again, that was why um, I, I bought this domain name, earth.coop. Um, I, I had a look on the co-op. I always wanted to do something around cooperatives, as a lot of people do. And uh, I was having a look on the cooperative website. I did a search for earth, and it's still available. <laughs> so last summer, I bought the domain name, earth.coop. They're about £100 a year. But it, I really just, I bought it as a, to put a flag in the sand, really, to say, this is where I think we need to get to. And I didn't, I didn't tell anybody for about six months. You know, I thought people will think I'm nuts if I tell them that I think, you know, we, we want to get to this global sort of united self-organizing system that has achieved, or society that's achieved biosphere balance. And, but to be fair, there are lots of uh, other organizations out there online that have have done this sort of thing and they've written their earth charters and all of that sort of stuff. But most of them actually looked fairly complex. You know, they're quite difficult to understand. Lots of text and lots of words and stuff like that. And it's like, and again, I, I just thought earth co-op with the single primary ambition of achieving biosphere balance. That's, that's the plan. I don't care whether we agree or disagree. <laughs> on stuff of course that's going to carry on we're going to argue all the way there <laughs> but biosphere balance has to be the primary goal as far as i'm concerned um because you know that otherwise there's no future for life on earth or for the majority of life on earth certain um, certain single-celled and multi-celled <laughs> beings might survive but, um but generally you know it's not gonna be a nice place to live and we're, we're clearly in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, as you're probably aware. Um, you know, this isn't something that's coming. This is something We're in it. We're in it. And yeah. by 2030, 2050, we're going to have, by 2050, they reckon 30 to 50% species loss. Of so, what is now, which is already a huge percentage of species loss. Massive. Exactly. You know, and the Great Barrier Reef has gone. It's dead, people. The Great Barrier Reef is dead. You know, and uh, I mean, I spent from age 16 to 23 just gallivanting around the world sailing. So I left school to teach sailing. I was going to be an architect. Um, I couldn't. Well, I couldn't stand the idea of spending seven years in college. And my sister was is seven years older than me, and she was just coming out of the university at the time with her degrees. And I was like. I can't can't spend that long doing technical drawing on the oh god uh, and so my dad took me to the London boat show and we went down there saying I was 15 and they said how can we get into sailing at such a young age and I got two offers basically one from a sailing school on the south coast of the UK and they said come down here we'll pay you 50 pounds a week and you can teach people to sail you can live on a campsite and we've got 50 boats and 100 people every week and so I had the car going fantastic um, and and then a guy from the Maltese Yacht Club, the Valletta Yacht Club in Malta, said, get yourself on a plane to Malta and I'll put you on some boats and you can crew around the Mediterranean. You know, that was at 15. 
it was just like, right, did my exam, bought a ticket, went to the letter, <laughs> knocked on his door, and that was the beginning. You know, it never, never really came back for seven years. Because, I mean, but the, the reason I say that is because there are so many places that I've been to, like Hawaii and India and New Zealand, and, and I wouldn't want to go in the water anymore <laughs> in a lot of these places. I mean, I don't know what the deal is with Fukushima, but you look at the, the you know the maps of the radiation out of Japan and all of that sort of stuff, and it looks like it's permeating its way all the way through Hawaii. You know, I spent a year on Maui doing whale watching trips on Hobie cats and windsurfing in Pukipa, which is the best place, one of the best places to windsurf in the world. You know, just living the dream. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the water quality is like there anymore. And in India, you know, there's these pristine places like Goa and Arambol and stuff like that. There's just so much crap coming down the rivers. And yes. you know, there's a river coming into the sea every mile or so. Uh, it might be pristine where you are, but just all of that stuff washing down from all the villages and humanity further up. It's our our salmon runs are being affected. I'm not sure what the test levels are in terms of of uh, uh, radioactivity um, from Fukushima, but it is impacting uh, this uh, area of the world as well. So this we are all connected. It's real. And you're on the uh, west coast, uh, west coast of, of Canada. Has it got to you then? Has it has it has it been picked up? Mm -hmm. That's how I understand it. I haven't done the I haven't done the science and math on it myself, yeah. so that's how I understand what from what's yeah. been reported. And it's still bubbling away, right? It's still bubbling away in Japan. It hasn't been fixed. This is this is another another of uh, what was it? The Deepwater Horizon. This is this is another level of Deepwater Horizon, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. where we've unleashed something, we don't know the consequences. Yeah. Um, it's happening over here while the dog and pony show of ridiculous world, a la <laughs> Brexit and Trump, are playing out in our attention spheres, uh, t pulling our attention away from where we actually have power and agency. So mm. with that, let's return to your work. Um, can I just take one moment? I'm just going to pause us for a sec. So we're back. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned Brexit and Trump, and you know that's that's become really significant in terms of um, the work that I'm doing. In terms of, I mean, a lot of people talk about Brexit and Trump and the reasons for it being people voting for change, you know, people feeling disconnected at the grassroots, and so they don't care what the options are; they just want to vote for change because they feel disempowered. And disenfranchised by the current system yes and that really you know leads to the heart of it and that's that kind of is the same message that i've heard ever since i've been in this game uh for the last 15 years you know whenever i've been to a conference and listened to a leading speaker you know like jonathan Porritt or you know any of these great people um and they always talk about grassroots democracy and community empowerment being the solution to global issues it's a, it's a hard one to get your head around, um, but none of the speakers ever used to go much further than that. They just used to sort of point to the solution and then like not go any further and say, well, these are the projects that you know, we could be implementing to solve this and tackle this issue. So can, I, I, can I just jump in yeah. for a second, Peter? What I would love to know, because it's 15 years ago now, since you had this original seed. So can you give us some insight of what, what has come together to have you come to these realizations that has driven you on this track? Well, yeah. Um, well, I was running an IT company. Uh, I, I got into, after I was teaching sailing in Wales, and I thought, I better get a real job. And I saw... <laughs> I, am I going to be a sailing instructor all my life? You know, <laughs> probably not a bad thing. I'll probably end up there. You know how they say you go all full circle. 
we'll probably end up back on a boat one day. <laughs> but anyway, in the meantime, there's a job to be done. Um, and so I decided to get a real job and saw this advert for a web designer needed. Um, and then it, it, it dawned on me that my father had been in IT for God knows all his life. He'd been one of the uh, system engineers. He brought one of the first computers over from the States uh, when there were three blocks of, or three stories of a block of flats, you know, everybody pushing and pulling plugs in and out. So he was a systems engineer, you know, for one of these first computers. And, so was, and I'd never even thought about IT to that point, you know. Um, but it, it just dawned on me that that sounded like something really fun, just with limitless possibilities and stuff like that. So I learned Flash animation. Do you remember when Flash was really yes. fun? Everybody I learned Flash. Flash. Right? <laughs> Macromedia Flash. Uh, so I spent three months, basically 18 hours a day, learning the tutorials on, on that Flash program, and I managed to make some balls. What year? So this is 2003, 2004? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I managed to make some balls go around the screen you know, like, like this. And because I wasn't very good at it, I kept it really simple. Uh, but then when people looked at it, because it was simple and sparse, they thought it was corporate. <laughs> and so basically I asked, a, I, I put together a small portfolio of projects. I had about 10 websites that I built for other people for free. And then I sent that portfolio out to about 70 employment agencies. And they came back with uh, uh, about 17 different jobs, something like that. Uh, and one of those jobs was to do animation for Honda, Honda, the latest Honda motor car in London. I couldn't believe it, you know. So I ended up going to Honda, uh, going to London anyway, leaving Pembrokeshire in Wales and doing this job. I got fired anyway on my second day because I was trying to, do some moonlighting with some of their staff and they thought I was trying to poach their staff. Anyway, they sucked me. Uh, and then I was offered another job in London and I realized actually there's loads of work here. But so maybe I use that as a fallback and I'll start my own company. And if that doesn't work out, I'll come back to London and do one of these jobs for £35 an hour. So, so I got everybody in the room that I knew was into IT and I said, I just told them that, you know, we're going to be doing great things and you should invest in us and got someone to invest £5,000, <laughs> which basically meant I could go back to Pembrokeshire and hire a, a 3D Max uh, animation guy. And we cracked on building stuff. And then three months later, when I was walking down a, a beach in Tarifa on a windsurfing break, uh, I got a call from Ivax Pharmaceuticals, you know, massive pharmaceutical company. They said they wanted us to do their, the, all the animation for all of their companies. Um, which ended up being a nine month job for three people at 30 pounds an hour, you know, <laughs> which meant that I could hire the best talent in Pembrokeshire. And, um, and so, and obviously there's not a lot of competition in Pembrokeshire. It's this tiny, you know, it's this in the middle of nowhere. You've got London on one side and you keep going west and you end up in Pembrokeshire basically in South West Wales. Uh, and so I ended up growing the company over three years to be the largest IT company in Southwest Wales and it was turning over 350 grand and we had a team of 10, you know, we were just living the dream, you know, it was just on a, we were just doing what we love to do. We would have been doing the same thing at home in our bedrooms, even if you weren't paying us for it. But So that was a lot of fun. Um, and during that time, I had a lot of social groups coming in saying, we hear you can build good websites and stuff like this. What can you do for us? And the local association for voluntary services, which is the, every district has an association called AVS, I call it. Um, they were the ones providing the technical solutions to social groups. Mm. And those te the technical solution back then was, if you're a social group, you know, and you want to look after the bats or the beaches or whatever it is, you've got to come in to us. We'll teach you how to build a website with Dreamweaver in the morning. And then we're going to give you a disk. And we expect you to go home and install this Dreamweaver thing on your web, on your machine, and you're going to update your own website. This is social groups. You know what I mean? What a nonsense. And I was just laugh. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this was the only support there was for social groups in the area. And it really dawned on me how the, all the support on the technology was there for the capitalist uh, business community, but there wasn't. Um, there wasn't anything really there for the social, the stuff that really means everything to us. 
Yes. And I just thought, no wonder we can't discover them or that they're not making much progress, you know, or not connecting with people as well as they could be. Not just because they don't have the technology, but also these people are community minded. So they're generally technophobic in a sense. They don't really, you mention the word technology and they're like, ah, Satan's, Satan's in the room. <laughs> um, so, um, so I came up with a project basically to deliver all the latest technology to social groups, but also at the same time, I, was, I had these companies that would work with the job center. And once people have been on job seekers allowance for six months, they would go to this other company as being long term unemployed. And then that company would approach me and, uh, and us and say, can you take these people on, on placements? Uh, and these people, again, they're sitting at home on computers all day long. So well, we basically filled our office with these people. And they were, you know, they were great. Nothing wrong with them. Some of them had some confidence issues and stuff like that. But after, after three months of being on a placement with us, you know, they really sort of grew in confidence and grew in skills and grew in socializing and social ability and all the rest of it. So that was really enlightening because obviously I wasn't giving them any therapy as such. I just gave them a seat yes. and some tasks, mm -hmm. meaningful tasks in terms of, you know, put the content in there and that's going to go up online and people are going to read it. You know, <laughs> and um, just that, that's all these people wanted. <laughs> that's all they really needed. And I remember one guy who came in, you know, and he had social issues and confidence issues and couldn't be in the eye and he had BO problems. And three months later, he was there sitting on our deck table with his guitar singing us a song. <laughs> and I just thought, well, that's amazing. I can't believe the transformation in him. You know, I hadn't done anything. I really hadn't done anything other than just, you know, be kind, I suppose. And be yes. welcoming and, and appreciative. I think you, you've mentioned this several times. And I think it's absolutely crucial is to just be to be appreciative of people's work. Um, is 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 really powerful. Is really powerful. It's very empowering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that empower to be empowering is transformative for a person. Absolutely. And I just want to do a bit of a shout out to Gertrude Wext, who's also in our group who has written a book uh, about appreciation and appreciation in organizations. So I've definitely also learned, I mean, I have a fundamental knowing that when you appreciate someone, that's a powerful thing to do. Uh, but I've also been able to learn from people who like Gertrude, who've done really deep dives into that. Yeah, exactly. So, so I thought, well, okay, so maybe I'd like to, this is an interesting project. Uh, I'd like to see if I could build something, you know, uh, offer. I could I could marry these things up. I could busy net the company I was working for and running could build the technical tools. We could provide a, a set of tools for the community uh, and social groups. And then we the engine room could be all these people who need placements and who are looking for experience. And so I could go to these social groups and I could say, there's the technology and here's someone who's going to manage it for you. Because I, I realized that if you turn up to these social groups and say, here's the technology, it's like turning up with a Ferrari, you know, it's like there's the Ferrari, off you go. And they go, uh, no, thanks. What do you mean it's a Ferrari? It's go. So really you needed to turn up with the Ferrari and the driver. And then look, all you've got to do is sit in the passenger seat and tell us where you want to go. <laughs> and that was kind of the project in a sense. Um, so then I said, I looked at, I was looking at the local community website and I was thinking, what's not there? And, on, and there's still plenty of community websites like this. And all you've got is the minutes of the local council meeting, you know, in, in sort of monthly PDFs and, uh, just so little about the actual what about the people and the groups and the events and you know everything that actually makes up this is uh, this is what 2003 now people so uh, I mean there's a lot more of that these days but it's still there's still so much information about a community that doesn't exist so that's where I came up with the idea of a comprehensive community resource because how can we possibly manage our communities unless we understand what resources we've got yes um and, and this would be a tool for connecting once the data was in there and uh the the different layers 
of information would be able to cross pollinate. And again, that was probably the most unique thing about it is that the, of most of the tools already exist, the car sharing, uh, the carbon footprinting, the skill sharing, you know, what businesses there are, what groups there are, what events there are, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff, the horticulture, the housing stock, anything, anything you can think of as a resource becomes a layer. And all of that, as you know, you can find in disparate places all over. Some of it's locked behind closed doors in the council. And, and a lot of it, when you drill it down to the hyper-local level, it will be very sparse on content. So the real the plan here was just to build it as a stack of layers. And so if you're going to an event, well, that triggers the car sharing app. And so, well, clearly you could be car sharing with these people. And when you're in the car, make sure you talk about these similar interests and these similar projects. It's, it's this personalization of data that becomes a proactive social engagement tool. You know, if you're feeling disengaged, you just turn it on. It's like, ah, oh, well, there's these retired people who are prepared to talk to you about, you know, the, your professional ambitions. And in terms of your social ambitions, there's actually, you know, 30 people within walking distance that all want to learn Rudolf Steiner as well. And um, click this button and, and what we'll do is we'll, it'll, it'll automatically arrange an event down the local pub. You know, and the pub's going, hmm, what event should I do next? And it can look at the resource management system and go, oh, look, there's 30 people that are all reading Steiner. I'll get them in and I'll get a guest speaker in. And, uh, you know, you see what I'm saying? So it's, there's all of these opportunities for connection that we can't really see and we're not really able to, um, to bring together, but that, that computers and databases would be absolutely fantastic at. And that resource management system still does not exist. Um, so I spent, I started putting in bids. I actually, I sold all my, all my shares and I started to, I tried to, anyway, go on, sorry. Uh, I just want to jump in because uh, part of, uh, you missed our conversation with the Global Challenges Collaboration yesterday, uh, but one of, Helen Fenadori joined us and uh, her work is in, in uh, patterns. Uh, pattern language and uh, you, what you're talking about is making visible the weak signals in her yeah. language it's yeah. and those weak signals need to be the strong signals that uh, that we can interact with to yeah. be able to uh, co-realize our collective value so yes yeah. awesome just but, wanted to but you can still maintain the privacy because it doesn't have to be all out in the open you just need to have submitted your skills in there or whatever it is these are my details but it's still private but you know the technology makes the connections and says so, and then and that's when it starts to come to the fore you know these 30 people can meet here or get on with this project and that's kind of where it, it, it all ties in with what i'm doing at the moment in the it, right now i'm work, working on one app which is the vocalize app which is all about um how to identify the priorities of the community. And obviously once you understand the priorities of the community, the resource management system can say, oh, well, the community clearly wants to do an allotment scheme. There's all these brownfield sites and there's all these retired gardeners and there's all these cor corporations that want to sponsor things. And you know, and it's like everything is there. It's just a case of, if you're trying to get these projects up and running with a clipboard, and and you know down, uh, and that sort of thing. It's just a lot of work, and most people are just too busy. Too busy. To of work. course, and we have the ability to uh, create technologies of connection. Uh, it's it's obvious mm. that that's part of what we need to do, and yet it needs to be done differently. It needs to be yeah. own, either owned by all of us or owned by none of us. Yeah. And, and I would suggest owned by all of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and that's a really interesting point. See, and there's so much talk about AI and what AI might do to us uh, when it becomes more intelligent than us, you know, uh, and the sort of the sort of the negative elements of AI. But uh, mainly because people are thinking a bit driven by the profit motive, you know, uh, with just financial gain in mind. 
Um, and so you're just going to get more, the corporations just getting more and more greedy for creating more profit. And then with the consequence of more social and environmental degradation. But if you think about what would social AI do, you know, this is the other end of the other side of the coin. What if you have a resource management system like that and your AI is programmed for cooperation and cooperative working. You know, that, that's a whole other, it's not something I don't, I don't hear pe many people talking about. You hear Elon Musk, you know, going, oh my God, we could get token over and all the rest of it. I don't hear many people going, oh my God, AI could help us create, you know, a connected world. <laughs> In fact, we, we have to leverage AI to create a connected world. How else are we going to manage 7 billion people? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I just want to drop in uh, just about artificial intelligence. I know we oh, yeah. had this yeah, conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. already, um, but the I, I just don't think there's anything artificial about it. I understand that it's <laughs> it's machine uh, got, uh, machine um, enabled uh, intelligence. But first, we have to understand what intelligence is. And there's a bunch of metrics of intelligence that uh, we haven't yet fully incorporated in our, in our ways of relating with each other. Uh, but I also really liked, again, Gert Gertraud's perspective. For, for her, when she hears AI, she hears appreciative inquiry. <laughs> um, okay. and, and in yeah. fact, if we were to turn our, our understanding of artificial intelligence to a form of appreciative inquiry, uh, we're still using our intelligence, but some other metrics that have some power too, which is appreciative yeah. that's actually out there and exists. Yeah. Just wanted to check that in. No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. But you know, you don't hear me, people really talking about that piece, but that's, that's what's coming, right? That's what's coming. Um, and, and if no one else brings it to the fore, then I'll be bringing it to the fore, you know, and until, so, <laughs> until I, don't know any, I don't know anyone else that's kind of trying to build that type of system. But you see, the interesting thing is, so I was doing that, I was raising grants for it and all the rest of it. And I, I raised about £100,000 for it over about five years, six years, won all sorts of awards and even met the... Met the for Vocalize? No, Localize. Localize. Yeah, so this was the resource management system. Okay. I didn't really start on Vocalize till 2008. So about okay. five years later. Um, so this was just creating this comprehensive community resource. But, and I did put a, try to put in a big lottery bid, you know, for like 250 grand. But I didn't have the skills to write it, to be honest. I probably still don't. <laughs> uh, you have to have, have your stuff together to be able to write one of those sorts of things and um, uh, so um, I came across um, the Zeitgeist movement Peter Joseph about 2000 he started emerging as in 2007 and he was advocating for the global resource management system which I thought was interesting because I, I was there creating a community resource management system and so I, so I touched base with these guys and um, a guy called, um, uh, um, oh God, Lucas, oh God. He's going to kill me for not remembering his name. <laughs> We're working with a lot of information and, you know, sometimes I don't remember my own name. <laughs> anyway, uh, it will come back to me. David Lucas, sorry, that was really bad. Um, David Lucas, uh, so he's, he runs the Zeitgeist Movement chapter or newsletter in the UK. He's a really good artist. And um, so, and it was him that pointed out to me, once I explained to him what I was doing, it was him that's pointed out, actually what you've got there is a route map to the global resource management system. If you can scale that up one community at a time and go the sort of cellular approach, you know, we can achieve that. And, and so we've been, you know, really good friends ever since. And uh, he's come to visit many times and all of that. So, so that was great, and he, he know he's a wealth of information, and I've learned a lot from him. Um, and then I got this award from Gordon Brown in 2008, and I got awarded Social Entrepreneur of the Year, and was the one to watch from Nesta. Uh, and, uh, and then I got home that week, 
and people was, my mum was saying, you're looking a bit tired. And the doctor called up actually a few days later and said, um, we, uh, we need to put you on dialysis straight away. You've got kidney failure. <laughs> You've only got 5% kidney function left. <laughs> so, which I was quite relieved in a sense because I've been really ill. I've been, and I've been sliding down. I've given up all my water sports and all of that sort of stuff. And I've been going downhill for about five years. Um, but because I had eczema, and all the doctors just thought it was you know, eczema, they hadn't actually picked up that it what that actually I'd had a biopsy in my mid twenties that said I was going to develop. It, I had this genetic condition called Alport syndrome, and it was going to develop in my mid thirties. And no doctor scrolled far enough down the screen to mm. say the symptoms you've got are nothing to do with eczema. You don't get crap lips with eczema and all of this other stuff I was getting. It's, it's your old port syndrome manifesting, you know. Um, and so this guy picked it up with a simple urine test, yeah. <laughs> and I was, on, I was on my knees. I had 5% kidney function left. I, I had a creatinine level of like six, 700. I had a blood count of eight and, you know, and anemic and all the rest of it. So, uh, so I was very relieved, actually, that he picked it up. And uh, because obviously with eczema, they say, oh, there's nothing we can do for eczema, you know. But with... Um, old courts there was plenty that they could do for it so so i ended up on dialysis for a year and a half and they stuck another kidney in uh in 2010 so yeah i have a third kidney here most people don't realize that if you've had a kidney transplant i end up with three i got three kidneys wow they didn't take the other one out they don't, they don't if, if they don't have to they don't take the other ones out it's only you as a donor that ends up with one so are you a, are you a bit wider then? <laughs> oh no no it's down in the front here. <laughs> <laughs> they stick it in the uh, they join it up to the artery in the leg. And it's a bit, a bit closer to the, a bit closer to the bladder. Okay. <laughs> wow. So uh, it was amazing, you know. After yeah, and it's been working fantastically ever since. Good. So so that's all good, isn't it? Yes. Wow. I mean, the, the thing is, is people's stories are so amazing, you know, um, and yeah, the, the only drawback is I'm on these immunosuppressants and about, I'll be on them apparently for as long as I've got the kidney in. But as you know, there's quite a lot of developments in terms of growing your own. I look forward to the day I can go to the supermarket and pick a collagen framework off the supermarket shelf for a kidney and get my stem cells out and grow my own just like I'm growing my seeds at home you know <laughs> uh, chuck my stem cells on this collagen framework and hopefully a few weeks later I'll have a kidney that can pop in and then once that's in I'll be able to get off these um, immunosuppressants well I wonder if you can migrate some of the uh, some of what's working with one kidney to the other to re I don't know I'm just making stuff up and I'm no doctor but <laughs> No, well, they're both they're both screwed. Okay. Neither neither work properly. Yeah. Yeah. So there you are. So, um, just in terms of, I, I'd love to do a little bit more of a dive into the actual um, the functionality and what has because there's the functionality of the of the vision right which obviously you have a very comprehensive um set of of guidelines for how all of the parts of democratic engagement uh, can work in an interoperable way for the benefit of community members as well as i would say there's a big benefit to people who govern to be able to tap into what people actually need um, yeah, they're, the, they're the two things really and, and the big missing piece is data yes people are going to hate a lot of people hate that sort of that word oh you know we're trying to solve global problems here How can, we're trying to build a community don't talk to me about data you know actually it's critical <laughs> the issue is is ask yourself the community where you live can you send me a link now for the priorities for the community where you live can you I can't. You can? I can't, no. No. Uh, most communities can't. You know, I mean, I got, there's an average of 7,000 people in uh, most communities. Mine's got around 10 to 12,000, I think. 
Um, you know, I can't just go on to Sketty where I live and see these are the priorities under these 10 major themes, you know, energy, economy, transport, health. Although I would say that here in, in what's known as Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, there has been a, uh, like the, our local government has been uh, really progressive and have had uh, what, what's called the Greenest City Initiative. Uh, and there's been some amazing minds and players on that in terms of people that are really deeply embedded in the community and coming from the community place. So, yeah. so in truth, we do have something that can be shared, but it certainly doesn't reflect all of the needs of all of the stakeholders. Right. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing um, and I'm not, you know. Uh, it, there's a huge amount of work being done. Fantastic yeah. job, you know, and some communities are getting to the point where they're prosuming, where they're producing more energy than they need. You know, some of these communities are sticking up a turbine and stuff like this, and they're putting in some solar panels, and now they're getting a million pounds a year benefit fund. And with that fund, they can, they can spend all of that on their yoga classes and their allotments and all of this sort of stuff. And they've got excess that they can sell to the other community. So they've reached this place of abundance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we all know of amazing projects that we've watched on TED, and they're on our Facebook feed, and we go to the conferences, and people give us these case studies of, oh, well, this is how you grow food four times as quickly uh, in the dark, and you can, you know, with aquaponic and hydroponic farming, and you, you, what you can do with this stuff is actually build it on site, so there's no carbon footprint. So you know, where there's um, the army barracks in the middle of the desert that's serving a million meals a year, uh, instead of shipping in all your greens, just build a massive hydroponic farm out the back door. <laughs> you put your hand out the back door and grab it all and, and bring it all in. I mean, it's absolute genius. So the, the best case study, you'll have to look this up later, um, of that is uh, in, in London, underneath the tube station, you had the World War II... Um, Bunker. Bunkers. Have you seen it? Yeah, and they're growing, they're growing all of this veg. Amazing. There. And the top chefs have invested in it, and they're providing all the herbs and everything for the best restaurants in London. And it all comes from, I don't know how many stories, 8, 10, 13 stories underground. <laughs> uh, because, you, you know, with the, using the blue and the red LEDs, they can give the plants exactly the light that they want for exactly how, much, how long they need it. And give them exactly the nutrients that they need and if you want it's all natural nutrients but obviously they can link that up to fish and if they link it up to fish all the fish poo then provides all the natural nutrients for the water you know it's just genius um, and there's loads of solutions like that isn't there you know um, uh, and every week I'm w watching small YouTube videos or whatever it is and I'm learning something new profound you know the LED street lights can also double up as car charging ports. And, you know, it's, uh, it, all the pieces of the puzzle are out there. And so the, the, um, the, the basic crux of the Earth Co-op uh, application is that we should be focusing largely, the issue is replication, not necessarily innovation. You know, we could stop all innovation tomorrow and just replicate all the good stuff that's already happening. Connected. Um, right. You know, there's already prosuming communities. Communities already know how to get completely off grid. They already know how to produce all their own food and, you know, organic food or whatever it is. It's all been done. Yes. The people, there's communities that have tackled homelessness issues. Uh, Every issue has been solved somewhere in the world, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, and we see those case studies. But the issue at the moment is I, when I watch that case study on TED, TED or whatever, and I share it into my Facebook feed, and I say, Jesus Christ, check this out. I'm inspired, but all I can really do at the moment is share and like. Right. Right. And what Vocalize enables you to do is take those case studies and seed it into a digital democracy platform for your community, your group, or your organization. And then you're able to prioritize. So you give it a rating, and then you give it comments for and against neutral. 
Um, so what that does is it feeds into a specific set of priorities for your community, your organization, or your group. And once something gains a certain amount of traction and support from the community, that gives the mandate for a group of people to come together as a working group to look at how we can actually make this allotment scheme or this energy scheme or this food scheme or whatever it is work in our community. And in that way, they can look at, refer to the templates that are already out there, look at the templates, um, and, and then instead of downloading it in a PDF form, which is largely how we do it at the moment, you know, there are best practice websites with PDFs on them, uh, you'd be able to download it into a project management system like Asana. So you'd have all the tools and the teams and the Gantt chart all downloaded. And then you would have your next task. Because usually if I say, oh, I'm going to, I really want to do this hydroponic farm. But and I watched the video and I've got to invest all this money and I've got to read this 80 page PDF and like, oh, Christ, that, that's usually the big barrier. But if you're downloading stuff into as teams and tasks and Gantt charts into Asana, it gives you your next task. Next task is to put out those teams to your community so that they can opt in. You need a leadership team, you need volunteers, you need customers, and you don't get out of bed until other people have made the same sort of commitment that you have. Yeah. And so I say, yeah, I'm happy to be part of the leadership team. Once the team is filled, okay, so the leadership team is now filled, the universities provide the training required to train up that leadership team to be able to run that project and two types of training one is general business development in terms of how to run a successful enterprise and sustainable enterprise and the other is industry specific training to in terms of how do i run a, a solar farm or a hydroponic farm or whatever it is and so now you've got the team trained up so you've got the team trained up you've got your volunteers committed you've got your customers committed with they all their payments in escrow so the point is is that you've moved this from an idea into being prioritized you've turned it into an investment ready project and that is the big issue is that there are there's plenty of money out there there's plenty of investors that want to invest in social projects and they're really sexy on the surface but when you drill them down it's like uh you know nice people <laughs> but you know, I'm not sure whether they're, they're not trained and the financial plan doesn't really stack up and the business plan wasn't written very well. And You know what I mean? It's like they haven't got that the foundations when, it, when you drill down and it becomes too risky. But if you can take those people and, um, and build the project out to, into an investment-ready project, then the money's there. The money will flow without any sort of an issue. Okay. And, and that's basically... So it's, it's this case of replicating all the good stuff everywhere. That is Earth Co-op. That is the Earth Co-op proposal. Simple as that. Replicate all the best stuff everywhere and get it done as ASAP. I also love, uh, thank you. Thank you for all of that. That was a good window into what that looks like in terms of boots on the ground um, and you know, in, in terms of how people might interact. Um, and I love that it's a co-op. I am a co-op uh, advocate and I'm a co-op person. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of a small credit union here in, uh, in town, just a one branch little guy. Uh, it's, An authentic cooperative bank. Yes, and it's... <laughs> as opposed to the cooperative bank in the UK, which is as corrupt as the rest of them. <laughs> Uh, well, the legacy banking systems definitely have their challenges. Uh, our little credit union was it it uh, was formed in 1976. Uh, it's called CCEC, which stands for Community Congress for Economic Change. Uh, and a lot of the initial people that came together to create the credit union um, were from the self-help community. They were from the co-op, housing co-ops, um, some of the for the first year and a half, we had all volunteer tellers. Amazing, brilliant. And our, some of our first loans were for daycares because that was a gap. Um, and there was no uh, uh, financial institution that was willing to invest or lend uh, for those. So yeah, um, it's, it's a real, real co-op. Yeah, 
Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and uh, you've probably heard the term of platform co-op. Yes. Uh, Joseph Eads Coates, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's big on that. And to be honest, it's one of the gaps. I mean, I know one of your questions was, you know, what are the gaps, what do you need? Uh, there's certainly a gap in my knowledge in terms of how to move all of this through to a more authentic um, platform cooperative, open source, all the rest of that sort of stuff. But we, we're kind of those things at the moment. They're all the intentions. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's, there's a little way to go in terms of really defining it properly and uh, getting all the actual systems in place where you can do that and attract the, the necessary investment to make this a global platform. Um, because let's not beat about the bush. We're going to need a shed load of um, capacity, especially development capacity to make it happen. Yeah. Um, so obviously that could work through the open source. I mean, yeah. And, and, and I, yeah. So that piece just needs working out more. So I'll just put that out there. So um, let, can, I'll just jump in for a second and let's, uh, cause we've got another 10, 15 minutes together. Um, and uh, I just want to make this really relevant to who we both are and what we're up to right now. Uh, so I, one of the things that I love the most about your work is that you're making it real and, you know, as I say, boots on the ground. Um, you're wanting to really make this sort of uh, uh, these processes to be meaningful uh, at the community level. So I am a community member. Uh, within the global challenges collaboration as well as other um, other networks uh, that we're both a part of uh, and I see a need for us to really understand uh, what our constituency of focus is what is it that we're talking about doing um, and what is it that we know that can help what are each of our different pieces that we bring to the table and how can we co-design together so I see your tool is a very powerful one for us to use uh, to be able to get down to brass tacks, as it were. Yeah, and that's it. And I think one of the core issues is how do you manage volunteers effectively, uh, so that everybody feels empowered and all the rest of it. And that that is, that is a challenge all over. You know, you could say even the staff, in, even though they're paid, they're still kind of volunteer. You still got to manage all of their uh, capacity. Um, and almost everybody is a kind of a potential volunteer inside an organisation anyway. Um, we're volunteering right now. Yeah. Well, I'm saying even if we weren't volunteering and we were paid staff, you're still kind of willing to do other stuff as well. But the, the, but the businesses, even the organisations, don't have the tools to manage them outside that capacity, if you say. Anyway, I digress. Um, but the, just to go back a little bit, the, we talked about the data and, and the, having the data enables you to do two things, specific things which you referred to. One is the whole self-organisation thing. Now the community can start to self-organise around a priority to make the, uh, to make the um, allotment scheme happen or whatever it is. And the other is around informing the representatives. The, the, we currently live in this hollow, hollowed out representative structure. And the, this is the reason why we got Brexit and Trump is because the representatives have no data. They're not going to their meetings with printouts of the priorities of the people that they represent. It's not what they do. So in education, uh, I could give you any example, whether it's students in college uh, and the learner voice, pupil voice system, or whether it's the local council, or whether it's the MP, or whether it's staff voice. That I could give you examples of how ineffective they are. So colleges, for instance, they nominate 200 representatives at the beginning of the term, and then they hold their first meeting in October. Ten turn up. And then they open the suggestion box and all the bubblegum wrappers and cigarette papers fall out. And then they get into the room and they say, right, what are the priorities of 10,000 students across four campuses? This is how ineffective it is. They plug in uh, something like the digital democracy tool that we're building. And they then get, I mean, in Gower College, for instance, I was just looking earlier today, they've had over 10,000 interactions in the last 60 days. That's because it's embedded in their mobile app with single sign-on, and it's embedded on the front page of Moodle, the Moodle intranet that they look at multiple times every day. So it's in their face. And it, it says, Tammy, you've got a certain number of ideas to rate. Um, 
uh, you know, click on this widget, it's got a call to action, you click on that and you rate and debate ideas. So Gower College, you've got 73 ideas. Every single, pretty much every idea is rated between 500 and 800 times. That's <laughs> you know, amazing. Massive data, that's around 15% of the entire student cohort, right? And imagine now you're walking in, the, diff the transformation, the those 10 student reps are walking into that meeting with this data, <laughs> going, oh my God, 800 people have said the Wi-Fi needs improving, uh, and X, Y, and Z, you know, we need more seating, and we need just healthier lunches, and we need water fountains out, all the rest of it. Now, that, the senior management team also makes a, a space on their agenda to receive the priorities for the student unions, for the student parliament. So the student parliament say, okay, let's push these three or four issues up to senior management team this month. The senior management team receive that and go, okay, well, we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll send this off to estates, and we'll send this off to catering, and we'll send this off to IT. And they apply some budget and some capacity to it, and then they feed back, you know, and close the feedback loop. Um, <clears throat> with representatives like the councillors and stuff, if you want to get something done, you literally say, well, I want, you know, road bumps or dog poo bins or whatever it is. And you, you literally go and meet the councillor in their house and have coffee. And that's how you get something done. But my idea hasn't been put into context with the other 12,000 people that live here. <laughs> you know, it's just that I went there and I pulled some, you know, I, I, I influenced him. But um, the influence could be and will be and is becoming data. And so the question next, because I know we're short on time, is how do you actually roll it all out? And the... The, the, the killer engagement strategy, roll how, it do you, out. how do you roll it out? How do you roll okay. this? Yes. Roll it out? Um, so we're already working in about 10 colleges and we've transformed student and learner voice there. And it's amazing, most of them have been with us for two or three years already. And they're just saying it's getting better and better and better. And from the technical integration into the mobile and the internet with uh, single sign on, yeah. and what we're looking at next, and we've got buy-in from the from Gwent College here in Newport, is integrating into the curriculum. Citizenship and digital skills is already on the curriculum. But people, or the tutors, for instance, they struggle to deliver the citizenship stuff. And so this is a, a great way to do that. It went to a Welsh back in ESDGC. ESD is everywhere in the world, right? So yeah. this what is that? Uh, education for Sustainable Development. Okay. That almost all colleges and schools and universities have ESD, and they have sustainable development in there. And so this can become part of that. Part of your ESD experience this month, and it becomes a monthly thing in the curriculum, is to just click on that widget. And I'm just gonna, we're just going to give you half an hour. Off you go. And click on the widget, and now they're rating and debating those 70 ideas that are in there. And that is part of their citizenship. And the next thing that they're going to do is they're going to put their postcode into their profile and that in the vocalized platform that automatically joins you to your local community your geographic community so now i go from having a conversation around priorities inside my school to a conversation around priorities inside my geographic community and now i'm suggesting well we need to improve the play park we need wider paths we need cycling schemes we need to be able to walk to work, walk to school. We need the parents to turn off their cars outside school to lower emissions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And become, that starts to generate data in a geographic sense. Now in Wales, all, every single school is plugged into one intranet called the hub. 1,700 schools all plugged into one intranet. And we're looking at rolling that out in the next three months. Mm. So basically there'll be single sign-on in the hub for all um, of these students into their own primary and secondary school groups for students um, and so then you roll out the curriculum piece on top of that ESD piece the education for sustainable development piece and now you've got every young person in Wales engaged in digital digital democracy informing their student parliaments in, informing the senior management teams now the second part of the curriculum comes through as a wave, put your postcodes in. Now we're generating all the data that is required for young people in their geographic communities. Whoa, we've never had that before. And now there's a, there's a youth parliament being created in Wales and all of these 60 youth representatives now will have data coming from, the, there's a thousand wards in Wales. So they'll have a dashboard 
of all the priorities for young people out of the thousand wards independently. And they'll be able to see what the trends are across the thousand wards. I mean, how sexy is that? <laughs> they'll be able to say, well, a uh, thousand out of the 1700 schools all want cheaper, healthier lunches. And they want to get rid of all the sugar. That's what the kids want. And the kids want to learn coding and they want gaming uh, tutorials, you know. This is what they want. They want to get fit and all of this. They know what they want. I, I could show you all the data, you know, maybe another, maybe we could do another session and I'll just show you screens. We'll do half an hour on screens and I'll just show you all these graphs and data and all that stuff would be really helpful. We can nerd so, out. So the second thing is that all the staff are also plugged in to the same thing. Into the, into the same intranet. So yeah. now you're engaging all the staff in all 1700 college, uh, primary schools and secondary schools in the country. Um, and then from there, you organize parent voice. So you've done student voice, you've done uh, staff voice, and now you're doing parent voice, which doesn't exist. We've got PTA, right? we've got parents, teachers, associations, but that is not a place where a parent feels comfortable saying, oh, I want you to uh, open up the playground after school hours so that my child can, or our children can play there. They're made to feel like mavericks, it's uncomfortable, and they fear, uh, there's a lot of fear there around, yes. oh, they're gonna make life difficult for my kid at school, I better not speak up. But if the parents are delivering an email or going in there with a list of priorities saying, well, 500 parents, these are the priorities, from the parents here you are and it's anonymized mm -hmm. you know and the pta and the school the school governors can now respond to that yes so now you get all the parents from all the 1700 schools doing this and they've all put the postcode in and now you've how many they're all residents and they're all members of their geographic community so how many people now do you have creating data in their geographic communities just a massive and so in four steps you roll out digital democracy uh, to students, staff, uh, parents, and residents. You're generating four different lists of data. Um, and then the next thing is the participatory budgeting, which is a big thing. Um, That's where of, the rubber meets the road. <laughs> right, this is, this is the, the way it puts the, the, the Bunsen burner under the whole thing, you know? Um, light a torch which is basically there's loads of budgets that are where there's mandatory public engagement, but the public don't know about them. Yeah. And there's the engagement is a hidden survey on the council website or whatever. They put the notice in the paper, didn't they? <laughs> oh, that'll do. Oh, but I'll tell you what else we could do. We could organize an event down the village hall and we could do post-it notes and we could do big sheets of paper and paper tablecloths. Yeah, that, and then we'll take photographs of that. that that'll do. And so in terms of culture, I'm trying to get across this visual of uh, the current consultation is like a snapshot in time. It's a vertical line. It's a survey. It's an event in the village hall or whatever. And what we're trying to do is create an ongoing conversation. It's a, it's a horizontal line that never stops. The topics never stop. The ideas never stop flowing, you know. Um, and so... That's, and I'm not saying get rid of surveys, there's an absolutely a place for the surveys, but it's just like in education, the, all students get this survey at the end of the year. One of the questions is, have you been listened to? You know, or how do you feel you've been listened to? And it's like, well, that's the first time you've asked me. <laughs> it's over so, now. <laughs> right, yeah, it's like, Jesus Christ. So Vocalize becomes the listening tool, and then, you know, you've got the surveys that take out a different type of data, which is absolutely fine. So the other key piece that you start to see this in a different way, rather than seeing millions of silos operating, you know, not communicating to get to each other, you start to see them all as a stack. Yes. And actually now, and the killer piece is to create a best practice repository of projects for that particular stakeholder community. What is it that students want in primary schools? Oh, they're all suggesting students become the teacher and they're all suggesting uh, they want an allotment or somewhere to grow food. And they were all suggesting, I don't know, goal nets or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but all of that can be put into a really tight best practice repository and it's and then seeded 
they're ready to be discovered. So if there's no content there, they can click on that and go, oh, yeah, I'll seed that into my group. Then it becomes a, uh, it gets discovered, it gets prioritized, and, and, and on it goes. And so it becomes a really effective and efficient way for replication. And if you think about that as a geographic scale, 7 billion people on the planet, 7,000 people on average per community, uh, that's a million communities. Okay, there's a thousand of them here in Wales, right? And we're going to do that next year. Yeah. Right? Awesome. There's 10,000 in, uh, in the UK, it's 10,000 wards, right? So that's 9,900, uh, 9,990 to go, uh, whatever. Uh, but you kind of see, if you look at it that way, it's a million communities all having an almost identical conversation, and the top two topics are how are we going to sustain our energy solution? And what's the sustainable food solution? If we just took those two topics, yes. and how many answers are there to the energy question? Well, well, what, 10? 500? No, no. It's, 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 it's small scale solar, large scale solar. It's, it's a wind turbine. It's hydro. Do you know what I mean? There's not that many. There's not that many solutions. I hear you, but there's also there's solutions on many levels. Is what I'm trying to say. Uh, just in following, I know that's not what you wanted to hear, but no, it, it. No, no. But I, in terms, of, I think what you're talking about is the adaptation of yes. those, right? And that, and I totally, and that's the bit that happens as it gets priority. Once it becomes a priority, then it again it gets adapted to the local circumstances by the working groups in those local communities. But you don't have to put that in the template in terms of just seeding people's um, uh, inquisitiveness for them to discover that this way of growing food is possible or this way of generating energy is possible. And then it's a, once it becomes a priority and it's inspired local people, then as you say, you get down to the myriad of different types of ways of applying that. So I'm totally with you. But in essence, there are actually a very small number of solutions right graspable one could say right, right, right. Um, so just in terms of, of uh, bringing this to a, a, a close for now I want to reflect uh, one of the pieces is uh, when when one where Daniel Harris and I kind of were really working into the uh, the Global Challenges Collaboration idea. Uh, where we really came together was in interoperability. Him on the side of technological interoperability and, and I was holding the space for human oper interoperability. So uh, but that those things are two, two things that are definitely needed. And one of the ideas that he had and that we kind of, this is part one of the examples of the types of work that can be done is exactly what you're doing and using one of the things that Daniel's been working with is uh, is using API's or so his one of his ideas was to use API's uh, as a single sign-on uh, so that you could access all of your democracy services so <laughs> uh, including um, advocacy organizations like change.org and uh, Avaz and you know there's a bunch of different democracy organizations in terms of 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 um, ways to be able to advocate yeah. for change you want yeah, to say. I mean I wish like I say next time we'll have to do screenshots I can show you my screenshot for that <laughs> so basically so, we're operating at four main levels uh, community level district level country level and global level and so a vase is obviously operating at the global level and then you've got things like 38 degrees uh, operating at a national level but what's not really happening the infrastructure for doing that sort of and it's not just campaigning though you see it, it goes beyond that so self-organization and informing representatives is you know it's a bit more compli complicated but the infrastructure is basically not yet there, not yet established at the community. We gotta grow it, we gotta grow it, but just let me finish because I wanna like, oh. I wanna weave back to this greater story that we're in, which is that uh, was, you know, that's a part of what we envisioned, bringing people together to collaborate would yeah. 
would give us the opportunity to create. So I just want to reflect to you that what it is you've spent the last 15 years growing and designing and developing was identified by our team as something that also needed to be done, seen through a slightly different lens and obviously not as, uh, not as you've created something real that people can kick the tires and use right now. Um, so what I would love to do is to, you know, share this with our community and, uh, and put together some of, and, and put together uh, collectively co-create how we may uh, participate with this so that we can, uh, we can use it as our own community. Yes, we're not a community of people that live locally, uh, but we do t come together with a uh, with a resonance of purpose that we, I think, can use your tool, the tools, uh, to be able to facilitate that coming together. So that's what I would like to float. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And the question for everyone really is: Are they going to start a conversation? With the stakeholder communities that they have influence over and we, we which... are the stakeholder community this is what i'm telling you peter and i agree that you know yes but i just want to be clear i'm saying that each one of us are the community so yeah. we are the stakeholders we have something that we want to do together i yeah. want to use what you're what you're yeah. providing yeah, yeah, in that yeah. yeah I, i'm just kind of putting out a message really to those watching as well, so just to do exactly what you've just done and think, well, you know, I've got, in, and we, we're talking about potentially doing some stuff geographically, yeah, and we're going to talk about that in, in the future episodes. Um, and we're talking about instantly, yeah, you're saying there's a stakeholder community here, yeah, yes. and I know people don't like the word stakeholder communities, uh, I don't know, give me another word for it. There's a community here, and we should, we could be holding an ongoing conversation, and that ongoing conversation can then feed in the times when we're on webinars and and that can be really interesting information because we can be saying well clearly in the last week since we met there's all these priorities and ideas that have come out and we've learned all of this stuff so the conversation never stops yes um and that's that's really the job that needs to be done globally is um and if anyone's a fan of jeremy corbyn i mean he said exactly that that our, we need to democratize our groups communities and workplaces and that's how it is. It's when people say, I don't know what to do. Yes. I put it to you that ask yourself what group, social groups, what geographic communities, and what workplaces do you have some sort of influence over? Yeah. Or do you participate in? Yes. And you're, the one thing that you can do, a significant thing you can do, is to introduce the idea of an ongoing conversation, leveraging dig digital democracy tools. Yes. And you will be amazed. All you have to do is put the tools in there and train people how to use them and, and make sure they've got access to it and yes. all the rest will flow. Yes. Because people know what they want. Like, like people get, oh, we need to teach people this and that. No, you don't. They, all, they know. I mean, well, there's a lot that they don't know and you can seed all of that best practice in. Like people don't know what they don't know. But you can see that by seeding in that best practice, you overcome that issue. Yes. But you'll be amazed what people do know. <laughs> yes. And, and back to appreciation, if you actually value what someone has to say, they are finally actually literally bought into the system. Yeah. And that's what we need. We need to reclaim our systems. And I see your tool as being one where we can really kick the tires of that. So thank you so much for all of your hard work and all that you're doing. Um, and for sure, it's so much fun. It's so much fun because it's so empowering. You know, uh, I empower other people, and it's personally so empowering to see it happen. You know, we Swansea University just launched it for staff for one um, for institutional planning on Wednesday, and then it totally independently, the library came in with 300 staff and said, We want to launch it for staff as well. You know, and, and that's how it kind of happens. And then you get these organizations, the language is starting to get there. The way that I'm conveying the opportunity is getting a lot simpler, a lot easier to understand. The tool's getting a lot better. The crisis is getting a lot greater. <laughs> you know, everybody's ready for this, and we really can do it. We really can achieve a social, sustaining, globally uh, collaborative community. We really can do that, and we really can take on these global challenges. Uh, absolutely. 
because as I say, all the solutions are there. We've just got to replicate all the best ones everywhere and adapt them, obviously. Yes. So in terms of, of uh, obviously I'm coming uh, in part really for myself because I am really excited to see and meet with other thinkers and doers and see where our work intersects. So that's bringing us back to this three-part series we're in. Um, but also this is on behalf of the Global Challenges collaboration group that's forming. So I, I wear that hat as well. And uh, and so part of that is in service to us understanding each other and what we bring and how we can use uh, the tools and practices that people are bringing with them. Uh, but lastly, this is in service, and it's not lastly, it's firstly actually in service to you in terms of you being able to articulate to different communities of focus how your work can be used and received. So maybe you can just encapsulate that for anyone who's watched this, how they might be able to participate with either localized or vocalize yeah localize not so much yet the, 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 the what we've figured out with localize in 2008 was because it's layers of car sharing community carbon footprinting well-being indexing and all of these different things you can't just build a tool and expect people to use it you, how are people going to start using it and the way that people start using it is we create the idea and it's already out there the idea of car sharing and car calculating the carbon footprint you seed all of those ideas into all the communities. And when a community says it wants to do car sharing, you turn on the car sharing app. But when the community says we want to do a carbon footprint because we've been inspired by this little video, you turn on the carbon footprinting tool. You don't go to any community and say, you should be doing this, you know, which is kind of how we do it at the moment um, because we don't really know any other way. But this way just enables people to discover it and crack on with it. I think I've already kind of explained what people can do all they've got to do is send in an inquiry and and we, we we set up a group for them and we train them how to use the tools it's just tools and training that's it simple as that so vocalize.org yeah you want to go to about dot vocalize which is vocal e y e s as in vocal eyes okay dot <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, we'll do a little checkout, so don't don't just run away just yet. Um, yeah. For for today, thank you so much for your time for sharing. Time. Hold on a second. I just want to put a shout out. I think the work that you're doing, obviously, none of this goes out without the work that you're doing. So I think it's a really um, important, um, powerful endeavor what you've taken on, and all this sort of appreciative inquiry is fantastic. And I'm really you know, fair play to you for taking on that challenge. Awesome. Well, it is a, it is an, it is a pleasure. I mean, really, this is playing in the garden of human awesome. So. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. And that would be my message to other people out there in terms of start taking on these global challenges, um, find your little niche of how you can affect change. And it becomes very empowering. And uh, it's a real, it's a real buzz. You know, I've been, I just, I'm buzzing more and more and more with this stuff, you know, uh, and yeah, it comes down to empowerment. You know, you're empowering me, so I feel good, and I'm empowering them, so they feel good, and they make me feel good, and <laughs> all about feeling good. Yes. Okay, so onward, and thank you so much, Peter. Until next time. All right, then. Thanks, Tammy. Bye. Bye.